Oye, mi gente, you're... Dímelo, mi gente. Welcome back to the fourth season of Oye, mi gente podcast. Thank you so much for sticking with us and tuning in. This is Viv Moran. I'm a multimedia artist from South Jamaica, Queens. Currently, I'm working on a new online store for my art. For more information, you can follow me on Instagram at Black Flowers Grow. At this moment, I would like to start us off with our daily affirmation. I want to invite you all, my beautiful gods and goddesses and everyone in between who tune in every week. And if this is your first time listening, welcome. I invite you to join in as well. Affirmation. I give myself permission to heal. I am willing to forgive myself. I am ready to forgive anyone I feel has hurt me. Now that we have charged our inner spirit crystals, let's get into today's conversation con mi causa and fellow podcaster, Natalie Flores. Born in the land of ceviche, lomo saltado, and pollo a la brasa, raised in the nation of immigrants, Natalie considers herself 100% Peruvian and 100% American with all the privileges and obligations. Natalie is passionate about su familia, travel, personal finance, coffee, dogs, and last but certainly not least, amplifying Latinx voices and elevating the visibility of the Latin American experience. Natalie launched the podcast Peruvians of USA on July 28, 2020, with the goal to share the diversity of the Peruvian immigrant experience in the U.S. and explore what it means to be Peruvian in another country. She wants the podcast to serve as a collection of memories, as many of us are first-generation immigrants. Episodes are released every other week, and the interviews are conducted in Espanol, Inglés, and Spanglish. The stories shared are deeply personal, and each gives us a new meaning to what it means to be a Peruvian immigrant. Natalie hopes the audience listens with an open mind and heart. Ultimately, these stories build a connection between Peruvians in the U.S., Peruvians in Peru, and immigrants around the world. On the professional side, Natalie works in technology at a financial institution. She's a graduate of Smith College with a bachelor's in engineering science and an MBA from the University of Michigan Ross School of Business. For fun, she enjoys weightlifting, running, dancing, and eating. During pre-COVID time, she enjoyed traveling. She has traveled over to 40 countries. You can listen to Peruvians of USA on Spotify or Apple Podcasts and follow her on Instagram at Peruvians of USA. Nat, how are you? Wow, babe, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here with you today. I'm excited too. How are you feeling? Uh, well, I am thrilled to be here. I'm also a little bit overwhelmed, as I mentioned to you earlier. Lots happening in my personal life and professional life. So, but I am thrilled to have this conversation with you. How's your spirit? Wow, that's a deep question. And actually, I've been listening to some of your episodes, and I know you asked that question of all your guests, and I always wonder what I would say. Um, I think the story that comes to mind is I recently asked my fiance how he's feeling, and he said, I have no time for feelings. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I think I think that's how my, my spirit is like we have no time for feelings right now. Um, we just had to get like certain things done. So I guess maybe my spirit is longing for some rest. Uh, and that rest is coming. I feel that you rest on is that. coming. <laughs> So to start the interview, I would like to offer you to take a deep breath with me. This interview may get a bit heavy, and I want to make sure that I am able to hold space for those feelings as well. Ready? Take a deep breath. Okay, let's start. Let's talk about the land of ceviche, lomo saltado, and pollo a la brasa, which, by the way, will be how I describe Peru from now on. Tell me about your parents. What were their lives like before migrating to the U.S.? 
Wow. Um, my parents' life. So they are from the rural part of Peru. My dad is from Huancayo, uh, the Department of Clean. Uh, and my mom is from San Gregorio, which is in Cajamarca, is in the northern part. Um, so yeah, they grew up in the rural side of Peru. They came to Maryland, uh, they came to uh, Lima uh, looking for opportunity, you know, like a lot of people in Peru come from the rural side to Lima to look for jobs, look for education. Uh, ended up staying in there and bringing the rest of the family. So it's almost like that was their first immigrant experience, right? Coming from the rural side of Peru to the capital and lived in the shanty towns outside of Lima. Um, you know, they met being neighbors and uh, that this was in the 80s. Um, and as I think a lot of Peruvians know, the 80s, 90s was a really hard time for Peru. So prior to, to coming here, it was, life was, life was tough. I think, um, from an economical perspective was tough for them. There's a story behind every decision to migrate. What was their motivation for migrating? So I think for my dad, one story that comes to mind that he's told me a few times is that, um, the, the money, like the money in Peru, the currency devaluated quite a bit. And so he remembers that he, he was, he had a, a job there and they gave him his, you know, like Christmas holiday lump sum. And literally I think the next day that was worth nothing because of how quickly the currency in Peru was, um, getting devalued. And so, um, I think that scared him a lot, especially having children and, and thinking about my brother my brother's future, my future, you know, just thinking about the future of his family. And at that time, my aunt had already migrated to the U S she came as my understanding is that she came as a nanny, uh, for an American family that she worked for in Peru. And so she came to the U S she was already here. She came, I think in the mid eighties. And so with the situation, um, getting worse and worse from a political and economic and, and economical perspective in Peru. Um, I think he made that choice to, to come to the U S um, to seek a better future for his family. Mm. Why did they choose to come to this country and not somewhere else? Yeah, I think the main reason they chose my dad chose to come to this country um, was because my aunt was already here. Um, I think they knew of neighbors who had migrated to other countries. You know, there was a lot of, um, people leaving for Europe, a lot of people leaving for Argentina, a lot of people leaving even for Venezuela at that time, Venezuela was doing very well. Um, and Mexico, a lot of folks were going to graduate school in Mexico too. I, I, I know that, but I think when you already have a family member somewhere, even if it's just one person, it makes it a little bit more uh, feasible in your head to make it there, um, especially my aunt having been here for a few years prior to my dad's arrival. Um, and I think there's also that whole like propaganda of the American dream, El Sueño Americano, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, the, like the America or the U.S. Estados Unidos is El País, you know, the, the country where you, if you work hard enough, you can make it. And so it's almost like a promise that has been perpetuated uh, across the world, across generations. And I think, you know, he, uh, he, I think as many immigrants still do believe that mm -hmm. and, and, and value that. And I think we don't think of Europe as the same way. Like you don't think of like the European dream. Um, but I think the other reason is also because American, Amer uh, the U S or America at the end of the day is a nation of immigrants. Um, nobody can really claim it. I mean, unless you're native American, of course, but that wasn't America, right? That was their land. Um, but I think it feels different perhaps when you think about Europe, uh, the French can claim it the Germans can claim it, but America is almost, it can't technically be claimed by anybody else except the Native Americans. So maybe that was another reason that it's a land of immigrants and you perhaps think that you would be accepted and embraced 
um, of course, we all know the story changes yeah. once you get. I mean, there. <laughs> I mean, this nation was built on the black on the backs of slaves, and then the huge shift to immigration for then it built on our backs we finish it off and then to still be treated the way that we are yeah and i think that's such a i think for the older immigrant generation here i think for my dad if i were to have that serious conversation i think he will understand it intellectually he will understand it but emotionally i think for the older generation of immigrants it's still hard to think about that this nation might not be as great as we thought for immigrants you know um yeah i think that's a hard concept for people to still grasp and and that's one of the reasons why i wanted to make sure that um immigrants now like the new generation is sharing their stories yes. right so yeah because even with the conversations that I have, like with my mom and I ask her things and she was like, no, I'm just very grateful to be here and X, Y, Z. And I'm like, but what about all the things that have happened? You know, because, you know, our parents, some of them um, had degrees, had good jobs and things were going good before Fujimori fucked everything up, you know, and then to leave all that and to come here and end up you know, becoming a factory worker or a dishwasher or doing like these little odd jobs um, to survive all while having their degrees or their masters in like either engineering, journalism, broadcasting, and not have the same here. So I think that there's like, tough it's tough i agree I th it's definitely tough especially if you had a, a career already in peru and if you were you know a professional profesional over there right um i do think my my family story is a bit different because we were working class like my dad did not have a degree uh, finished high school. He went into the military in Peru. My mom um, ended up um, getting accepted to university there, which is a huge deal because com it's so competitive mm -hmm. to get into a university over there. It's more competitive than I think I've seen anything in the yeah. U.S. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, she couldn't finish because there were a lot of protests happening and, like, a lot of just turmoil in the economy and she wasn't able to finish. So from an opportunities perspective, they definitely did not have as many opportunities as professionals would have in Peru. Um, so coming here, I think the thing they value is that, you know, like I, my parents like are not college educated mm -hmm. here, but yet they were able to work hard and, and get ahead and push their kids ahead. And so I think from that sense, I do agree that uh, a lot of our parents are very grateful to this country to have given him, given them those opportunities. But at the same time, I think sometimes us, the younger generation, we look back and we're like, it didn't have to be that hard. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Even with like the little education, because, you know, there's a lot of the um, peruanos that I have interviewed. Um, some of them have like similar stories to mine where, you know, our parents were profesionales. And then other ones were, you know, like your story, your parents grew up in a rural parts of Peru. And even with that, like little, case, um, little education, because there's professional education, but then there's life education, which is a whole like 100% valid experience. And even with that, you know, knowing how to survive and how to make do for yourself because, you know, the streets and how you lived in rural areas teaches you things that a professional life, a professional education doesn't teach you. So being able to create something from nothing, but it should still not be that hard, you know? Um, how do you think that migration has changed them? That's a, such a great question. Um, so I think um, 
It's interesting because I think it's different for my mom and my dad. So as I mentioned, my dad didn't go to university, right? So maybe he felt limited when he was in Peru to like manual labor, just manual labor. Um, and, and even though like here in the U.S., he still did manual labor, um, but maybe limited um, from a professional sense uh, or economical sense. Um, and I think coming here and... I think, it, I, I mean, overall, I do think it made him more responsible. Uh, you know, parents sometimes talk and like you as a kid listen. And, you know, my dad was perhaps not the hardest working father in Peru. And, and here in the U.S., you don't have an option but to work hard as an immigrant, right? And so I think here he just became a lot a lot more hardworking, a lot more responsible, Uh you know, he was the only brother of all his siblings who was here. So he kind of became the head of the household, the entire family, and, and kind of lead, you know, kind of like the patriarch of the family and kind of try to provide guidance and, and mentorship to, to the rest of the family that was coming afterwards. Um, and so I think it was a positive experience overall for my dad. Um, however, I think for my mom, because she had tasted university in Peru, um, and she had tasted what the possibilities could be as she at some point finished her education, which unfortunately she didn't. Um, coming here, one way she describes it to me is like, it's like, it's as if she fell in a hole and didn't know anything. It's like, it's almost like she can't, she had to learn everything all over again. I think this is true for both of them, but it definitely affected my mom a lot more where she's like, I don't know the language. I don't know how financial systems work here, how the education system works here. I just don't know anything. And I feel that I need to rely on my husband so much more. And my mom was this like fervent, independent woman in Peru. And to come to the U.S. now and feel like I cannot take care of myself without my husband, I think that was hard for her. And it's still hard for her, interestingly, after two decades of being here, right? Um, so I think it changed him in that way where my dad is, it made it more responsible, maybe see the future brighter. And with my mom, it made her feel like she couldn't be as independent as she was in Peru because language barriers and other things. So, I mean, migration can be hard in all types of ways, you know? Where did your parents, where did you and your parents find strength during difficult times? Where did we find strength? Um, I think I think the first thing that comes to mind for me is we found strength in each other. Um, we, I think that the thing that comes to mind is my dad went through sort of like um, a tough time a few years ago where um, he. Um, was questioning perhaps his place in the world, mm -hmm. his contribution to the family, because my brother and I are already adults, were able to take care of ourselves. And it affected his sense of self quite a bit. His purpose. Um, and his purpose, yeah. And like, I'm kind of going around the word depression, but that's basically yeah. it, right? And so, and that says a lot already about like, Sometimes us Latinos were not as comfortable talking about stuff like that. Yep. But it's like, yeah, kind of getting around the brush. And like, I think now he would say that. He would say that, yeah, he, he battled depression a few years ago. And, and that was a tough time for the family because there were some health issues happening as well. And, you know, I remember telling my dad, look, dad, you, you did your job. You raised us to be independent individuals. And so like now you can lean on us, right? So like you can rest, like you don't have to look out for us as much as maybe you did in the past. And he's a dad and he's always going to try to look out for his kids. But, uh, you know, kind of like the way, the way I described it to him was like, it's not like a beam, like a, in a structure. Like if one is weak, there are other three in that that can hold it together. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you are allowed. And I told my dad, I was like, you're allowed to be weak because you have a strong daughter, you have a strong son, you have a strong wife who's going to have your back. And all of us are allowed to be weak at some point in our lives, uh, as long as we all support each other and hold each other together. 
Um, so I would say, yeah, we, we have found strength in each other. I think for me in the tough times, I understood at a very early age what my parents have left in order to give my brother and I opportunities. You know, you leave your country, your family, your language, your culture, any, any sense of like feeling like you're at home for a new country. And I think I always understood that because I came at the age of 10 where I'm old enough to understand some things, but also young enough to like assimilate, I guess, in a way to a new culture and country. Um, and so I would always go back to that. I, I, it's almost like I'm not going to waste my parents' efforts and I'm going to try to make the best I can out of the opportunities that I do have here. Yeah, I totally agree with you on that. What was the most difficult part about coming here? I think the most difficult part at first was leaving my family over there. Um, I grew up in a neighborhood where my abuelita was literally next door to my house. My aunt was two doors down. My other aunt was two doors down. My uncle was one block over. And so all the cousins just got together and played. You always had my cousins to play with. And even though we were working class and, you know, it was just, there was always family. You just never felt alone. And I think coming here and people stay in their house <laughs> and they don't go outside and then there's like less, you know, community events. Maybe there is more now that, you know, I think that was hard. Um, that was very hard. It's just like that sense of like, your family is your everything, like your nuclear family, whoever you're here with is your, it's almost like the only family you can rely on. As a person in Peru, you always have like cousins, uncles, aunts, abuelitas, you know, so um, I think that was hard. And I think the other part that was difficult for me was my identity. Mm -hmm. I think I struggle with like, all right, so I know I'm Peruvian, but am I, a hundred percent Peruvian or am I now 50% for like, do, should I care about things that are happening in Peru? Should I care more about things that are happening here? And I think I never, I struggled to figure out that balance until recently. It wasn't until like, I want to say maybe a year or two years ago where I made peace with like, I am never going to be a hundred percent Peruvian from Peru. I'm never going to be a hundred percent, whatever Americans consider here. And I kind of have to find my own, you know, balance with that. Yeah, it, it, there's definitely this um, belief, I think, even with like our own people where they consider Peruanidad, you know, you got to be from over there. You got to work over there. You have to talk the language over there, even with the slang, you know, like if you don't know what the slang is or if you don't talk with the Peruvian accent, you're not really Peruvian. And then there's the other belief that, you know, Peruvians got to look a certain way. Like, all of us have to look like cara de papas, you know? And not all of us look like that. So... No. Nope. <laughs> yeah, like, it's... And then over here, it's like, well, you start speaking Spanish, you, and then Americans, you know, spot you like a mile away. Oh, Spanish, nope immigrant they're not from over here and then you start losing your own accent which is you know like an issue with me like I don't have a Peruvian accent so then it's like when I tell otro peruano like oh yeah I'm Peruvian really and then I don't look like yeah. most Peruvians because you know both sides of my family are mixed black and indigenous and then it's like, bueno, you either got to be black or you got to be indigenous. And then if you're in the middle, yeah. then entonces eres una peruana blanquita. You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, I agree with you. Like, especially with the whole accent thing, I went to a party. It was a Peruvian party. No. Uh, this, is when I, this is when I went to Connecticut. I, when I lived in Connecticut. And I went to a Peruvian party. And I, there's a group, you know, gathering, talking, drinking, and I, you know, introduce myself and they're like, uh, they're like, oh, where are you from? And then somebody is like, oh, are you from Mexico? Because yes, my accent is actually more Mexican than Peruvian. And it's because like, when I came to the US, we used to watch what? Univision. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> we used to watch the Navy SEAL, so I picked up the accent, and I was like, wow, even being among Peruvians, nobody's, able, nobody's even able to tell that I'm Peruvian. And I was, I felt like, you know, you, your sense of identity is like, I don't want to, uh, it's question. Yes. And so you start to question it. Yeah, so it's hard. Yeah, yeah, like... I I have no accent. Even when I talk Spanish, sometimes I sound Mexican, sometimes I sound Colombian. And then my girlfriend often says, like, oh, you sound a little Peruvian there. And I'm like, how? But how? How do we sound? But like, <laughs> you know, um, from a kid's point of view, sometimes I feel we don't share the same realities as our parents especially when it comes to the migration story, how we lived here, how we associated with people. What was your experience? So my experience, I think the tough part about my experience was really that responsibility that is placed on immigrant children to translate for their parents. Mm -hmm. And I still react to like moments when I'm put in a position to to do that role, to be that role for my parents, you know, they still need some help in the translation uh, department. And so I, and my whole body reacts. Like I already trigger. feel like tense. <laughs> yes, I, I feel trigger anytime. Like I feel like I'm in a position where I need to sort of be the one that's reading and trying to understand something technical from a letter or whatever and then I have to make a decision I go back to that like 10 year old or 11 year old who you know was asked hey there's this bank notice there's this IRS notice there's this health notice there's this like immigration letter that I don't understand tell me what it says and I'm like I'm trying my best to translate it and I don't know all the words right and there's that whole like dynamic of you trying to explain your to your parents all these technical things that you're reading in the letter using your dictionary pre-google yeah. right uh using your dictionary to understand and then your you know your parent perhaps putting that responsibility on you to be like well what should i do i'm like i don't know i'm 11. <laughs> For real, for real, because I remember doing the same thing. And then a lot of people ask, you know, like, so what's like your, you know, when I'm making like a resume or when someone asks me about my work experience, I'm like, can I put paralegal? Because technically, you know, we learn to be a paralegal at a young age. And I used to carry on this little pocket English and Spanish dictionary because I have to be like, how do you say that? And what does this mean? And I'm like, I need you to tell the lawyer that X, Y, and Z. And I'm like, Dios, how do I say this? You know? <laughs> and like, even when it comes to like, parent teacher conferences were so stressful for me because it's like how do I tell my parents that I talk too much that I'm smart but I talk way too much you know how do I tell them that I failed this test and you know like all it, it was just I don't know I kind of almost feel like in a way you know the Peruvian experience for kids is good and bad it's you know borderline of I don't want to say abuse but almost kind of like because we stop being children and leave that innocence and we become adults now, especially if we're older and we have like a sibling who's younger, it's like now we become a parent. Now we got to parent our own parents. We got to parent ourselves and parry, parent our siblings. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. And it's, it's something that I thought about a long time, like for a long time, even like thinking about like services for immigrant families, like, I was thinking like, maybe there's a translation, like maybe somebody should come up and like, maybe I'm giving somebody a million dollar idea already, like, somebody, there should be a phone number where like immigrant parents can call and just be like, or let me fax you this now that there's more technology. So like you alleviate that burden from your child to translate 
you know, for you, all these documents. And, and, and it's, and it's something that I didn't realize I was resentful about until like, mm-hmm. um, I think until later in life. And then I remember when I went, when I was applying to college, you know, I was like, let me get as far away as I can. Oh my God. <laughs> And, and, you know, because like, I need that space where I can just like, can I focus on me? Can I worry about myself? But I think as immigrant children, we never really have the luxury to worry just about ourselves. Like we're, even when we're, even when we're far away from our family, we're always thinking about, all right, well, thinking about my parents, are they okay in retirement? Are they going to be okay? Um, You know, and, and to your point, that there are some positives too about it. Um, You know, we become outspoken early in life. We are able to (laughs) to challenge authority because because, like we've been challenging authority from like ages, like, you know, since being 10 or whatever. And so I think I do appreciate that part that it it did teach me to challenge authority, to ask questions, to abdicate for myself, to abdicate for the people I love. Like even now when I have to go through any, like, you know, any, I have to be in any conversation with a lawyer or a, or a doctor or, or a bank or whatever, I have no issue asking questions because like, I'm like, I've, I've been doing this since I was like 10 years old. So I have no shade being like, I don't know this, explain it to me. Like, you know, so yeah, there are some positives. Yeah. Tell me about a time when the lack of representation hurt you the most. I think for me, interestingly enough, it wasn't the lack of representation of Latinos because there was, I came in the the nineties, right? The mid nineties. And so the representation of Latinos was actually very, very small. Like Gloria Stefan was, you know, there obviously. JLo had just come out, so that was great. But I think what hurt the most was that there wasn't um, perhaps like a South American representation or something that I could connect more to, like, or like, uh, you know, una, alguien de, una princesa de las Andes or something like that, right? And so I think it was the fact that the Latino representation was mostly Mexican, mostly Puerto Rican, mostly Cuban, um, you know, and then slowly other representations came about, like Colombians started like, you know, getting into the scene. And and so that was like, all right, South America is getting represented. But I just, even, even, I think what hurt me the most that even among the Latinos, I never saw a Peruvian, right? I never knew if there was a Peruvian, um, like a role model out there for me. And once one story I shared on the on my Instagram story and in my Instagram post was that I had a chemistry teacher who one of his assignments was that we find a scientist uh, from our home country. If we're if we're immigrants from our home country and if we were from the US from your home state. And I remember thinking like, all right, I'm not gonna find a Peruvian you know, scientists here in the U.S. Like, one, this is pre-Google. So um, I can't just Google this. And so I remember going to him and saying something like, can I find a Latino scientist? Because I knew I could find a Latino scientist, but I wasn't sure I could find a Peruvian scientist. And he's like, no, you have to find someone from your country. And he was very purposeful, like, with that assignment, right? It was more than just finding a person. It was, like, for you to find a role model that you can identify with. And I remember digging, somehow researching, just trying to find a Peruvian scientist. And I found a Peruvian astronaut. His last name is Noriega. And, you know, he came, to, his parents came to California. I think he came, he was born in Peru. I think he grew up in California. And he's a um, Peruvian-American astronaut. And so for me, that was a very meaningful experience because I was like, oh, wow, there, there are Peruvians out there, right? And... And so that was a very uh, impactful experience for me. Yeah, I feel you on that, too, because, I mean, the only Latinos that I knew growing up here, like I got, I arrived in 1991, Puerto Ricans and Mexicans. There were a few Dominicans, but it was just mostly Puerto Ricans and Mexicans. 
And so I just like when people were asked me, like, are you Mexican? And I would be like, oh, no, I'm not Mexican. I'm Peruvian. Where the hell is that? So I would just be like, I'm Puerto Rican. You know, and then even with like projects, finding anything to do with Peruanidad, like, you know, I just, I wouldn't say a couple of years ago, but I would say maybe like in my early 20s, I found out that Benjamin Bratt was Peruvian. So when I saw Miss Congeniality, I'm like, oh my God, he's Peruvian. You know, and I was, that was like my, the only thing that I hung on to of Peruvians yeah. in the media is <laughs> like Benjamin Bratt's acting with Sandra Bullock. You know, right? Yeah. So yeah, no, I remember finding that out, and I was like, "Oh yes, this is why." Like, I mean, I found him handsome at that time, yeah. so I was like, "This is why he's so handsome." But like, yeah, I was incredibly happy to also find out about Benjamin Brad. Like, his mother is Peruvian, um, so yeah, that was pretty awesome to find yeah. out. Oh, and also when I found out Tupac was named after Tupac Amaru. Yeah. The, the Inca, you know, revolutionary in Peru. And because, like, I knew of Tupac here, and I was like, wait, is this a coincidence? Maybe I'm imagining things. And then, you know, as you research and as you learn, yeah, Tupac was was named after Tupac Amaru from Peru. So Yeah, his mom, Afini Shakur, who was a Black Panther, um, was very intentional about naming him that. And, you know, even with all the BS that surrounded Tupac, he lived up to his name and being very revolutionary. So I named my cat that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> my cat's named Tupac Amaru Shapur because, you know, cat's purr. <laughs> That's yeah. hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> I love yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> and, and he likes, like, we, when, um, when me and my girlfriend, we had our little basement apartment and my girlfriend would be in there um, recording and making beats. Tupac would be there on top of like her little machine, you know, like napping there. And I'm like, oh, he's living up to his name, you know. Oh, so yeah. cute. <laughs> I like to believe that from the lack of representation it has pushed us more and more to become our own storytellers. What pushed you to take it a step further and create the podcast Peruvians of USA? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think it, it was, it was, you know, COVID has made everybody sit down yeah. <laughs> and, re and reflect. You, it's like, it's like mother nature, all the goddesses, God, you know, say like, sit your ass down and start reflecting on your life, you know, because this is the time. And, and sort of COVID did that for me where I started reflecting more on my own experience, reflecting on the things that keep coming back that we don't address because we don't have time and because everything's go, go, go. And um, I remember, you know, what I share, feeling like, yes, we do have some Latino representation or I did see some Latino representation growing up, but not something that I could fully identify with because at the end of the day, Latinos, were just so diverse. We come from everywhere. We all have allegiance to each other, but we also have allegiance to our own culture, our own country, our own way of saying things, right? And so, um, and then I also remembered a story that I, I volunteered at a elementary school once with um, other, with a Peruvian organization from Connecticut called um, APAPRO, which is like Association of Peruvian Professionals. Um, I was part of that organization in Connecticut uh, when I lived there. And we ended up volunteering at an elementary school and one of the volunteers was a doctor and you know he introduces himself to to um to the class and he's like my name is xyz i'm a doctor and in connecticut and in, in the hartford in the greater hartford area there's actually a strong peruvian community and so there are children there are peruvian children in the schools and after as we were wrapping up the volunteering or volunteering time and like the kids were leaving the classroom one kid who's Peruvian, and he must have been an eighth grader, um, came up to, uh, you know, the doctor and said, I didn't know there were Peruvian doctors. Oh. And I was like, oh, oh my God, my heart. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> and so that's, I think, really what kind of pushed me to create Peruvians of USA, because 
um, I do want our, you know, our community to see themselves reflected. I do want them to hear the different stories, you know, whether your family was well off in Peru and came here or whether your family wasn't well off and came here, you know, I think we need to hear all those stories. Um, and, and so I love, I think everybody has a story to tell. I think everybody's story is something that we can learn from. And so I think that was really what the catalyst that pushed me to create Peruvians of USA. I love that. Yeah. You know, I think now is the time for representation because rather we're adults or children, those things matter to us so much, especially because our identities are being questioned now more than ever. And everyone needs something, someone, you know, to relate to, you know, even as an adult, I'm very grateful for Connie putting together Alegria Peruanex because, you know, like I've never seen so many Peruvians in a one room, you know, besides the little parties that I had at home, you know, but other Peruvians and Peruvians that look like a lot different. And even on the cover, like when she sent me the cover, you know, I, I got so emotional and I started to cry because I started thinking of my grandmother and my grandmother till her like dying days would never admit, you know, that she is black because of everything that she been through, you know, growing up and then to see her being represented through Mika was emotional and happy. And, you know, I hope that, you know, because my grandma passed, so I hope that she was able to, you know, look down and see herself and relate, you know, to these images. And then even having Victoria Santa Cruz making a comeback with that poem, Soy Negra, first thing that came to mind was my grandma, you know? Yeah, I also love that Connie was so intentional with the cover. I think as Peruvian community, as a Peruvian community, sometimes we forget our Afro-Peruvian brothers and sisters, and they give in so much to our culture, just like anywhere yes. in the world, right? Yes. <laughs> just like just like the African diaspora is given so much to the world, and I think we just need to as a Peruvian community, we just need to acknowledge that a lot more and we need to celebrate it a lot more, um, you know, like not with music, art, poetry, sports. Look at our sports yeah. teams. You know? Yeah, so. <laughs> I mean, oh, my heart is full. On a scale of one to 10, how has your experience been so far with your podcast? How has my experience been? I think, I mean, I, I'm going to say eight. And the reason I say eight is because I wish I could give it more time, right? At this moment, it's been uh, sort of just me trying to still establish the processes, um, figuring out some of the editing, reaching out to folks, um, developing a vision. And it's always more fun to kind of team tag with someone else on doing that. Um, but I think I would say that in terms of just eight, because I know there's a lot more room to grow, a lot more that I can give to to the podcast and um, and maybe a lot more that I can share. And it's also an exercise for me to share my own story. And I notice how I hesitate, right? I'm asking all these questions of people like, hey, tell me about X, Y, Z. Tell me how you came, what you felt. But when I, but I hesitate to share that, those experiences about myself and, and and I definitely want to share a lot more of that um but I have enjoyed every conversation that I that I you know had with the different guests each of them have opened their their hearts you know they have reached out afterwards and said like wow I have not reflected on this experience uh, before or for a long time and so this interview has helped me to reflect um yeah so I would say eight because there's room to grow and I definitely want to give help it grow and I want to give more to it so I like that I mean even with me my this podcast journey has been a wild roller coaster especially you know dealing with 
you know, a mental health disorder. And so I've learned a lot about myself. I've learned a lot about responsibility and consistency. And, you know, there's been so many times where I just wanted to quit. I'm like, done. I can't do this anymore. But then, you know, when I check statistics and logistics of the podcast and then I see how many times we've been downloaded and where we've been downloaded you know I'm like this is a responsibility that I have that I have taken to myself and thought like people are really listening out there and somebody out there is like wow I'm not alone you know, just the other day, I noticed that somebody from Africa was listening to the podcast, and I was just like, holy fuck, like in Africa. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, in Africa, and I was just like, oh my god, you know, I, I have to keep pushing myself to continue, even in tough times where I just want to be like, I need a break, but this whole thing has been a rewarding experience you know yeah yeah and like I was listening to the most recent one I listened to in your episodes was the bipolar Mm -hmm. when you share when you share your experience when you gave us educational and an education on it because I wasn't as familiar about what it was and how it manifested in, in different people and like you were so vulnerable that I started to like get emotional and cried and and I really felt there with you and I hope that I hope you also know that like when people listen to you and your episodes we're all sending you like positive vibes we're all there with you like even though we're not in the room with you like you know holding on to you or holding your shoulder like I just I just was like sending you all positive vibes and I was so impressed and with like how you share that vulnerable experience. And I, you know, can only hope to get to that point where I'm sharing those vulnerable experience in in my own, like, you know, podcast too. Yeah, it's vulnerability is definitely very, very hard because, you know, my mom has trouble expressing vulnerability. And, you know, migration does that, I feel. And... There's no time, like you said, for feelings. There's no time for weakness. There's no time for sadness. Porque hay que trabajar. You have a responsibility to your family, to your household, to your children. You got bills to pay. You know, so with that, I was just like, that's how I learned to survive. And, you know, but with therapy, I also learned that being having strength isn't always not crying. You know, having strength is crying and being vulnerable and showing vulnerable because that's strength. You're strong when you show vulnerability. You know, sadness isn't a weakness. You know, it's it's strength to show it. Yeah, it takes, I almost, one thing that came to mind as you were saying that, like, we have no time for feelings as immigrants uh, just now, like, it's almost as we learned how to be high how to function, how to be highly function individuals among even depression. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because I've had depression for, I don't know, I think my dad noticed it when I was a kid and he ended up getting us a dog. And then I've been seeing therapists since I was like 13 years old on and off. And you know, with that, it's like, I didn't have time to figure out, like, I don't want to see no therapist. I didn't, I didn't know what that was. I was just like, I need to go to school. You know, like, I got to translate for you. I have all these responsibilities, you know, but, you know, now I'm just not afraid anymore. I think that also comes with time. Yeah, and it's a, it, and to me, it almost seems like it's a space where we can take care of ourselves. We're so busy taking care of our families, each other. And, and it's not to say that, that our parents don't take care of us and don't take care of themselves, but it, we're such a collect communal society, like, or we're just like that everybody's taking care of everybody and 
like going to therapy, having that space for yourself allows you to look inward and like, just let me take care of me. Right. Like, so. Yeah. yeah. I think it's important for us to take a step back as children of immigrants and we focus that on us, especially as adults, because now we got to put in the time to take care of ourselves. We've taken care of everyone else and it's time, you know, it's okay to be a little selfish and love ourselves a little bit more. Ooh, girl. It's okay. <laughs> that's, yeah, it's okay, but that's, that. it's heavy. It's, it's, it's hard to accept. I think that's something that I, took me a long time to even like entertain. And now it's a daily practice to be like, all right, I'm going to take that time to yeah, take care of myself. Yeah, like my mom used to always say, as I've gotten older, you know, when I would take my trips to Puerto Rico, she'd be like, it is tan selfish. You know, you should be doing X, Y, Z. Me debes de dar a mí el dinero para pagar esto y el otro and X, Y, Z. And I'm just there like, you have another daughter and I've taken care of both of you guys. I've put so much emotions into this family that now I'm working for myself. I don't ask you for anything, you know? So I think it's time for me to love me. Did your mom, did you see your mom take care of herself growing up? No. No, I don't think my mom, the only self-care I feel that she has ever done, it's probably getting her nails and her hair done. And that was to that extent, because at the end of the day, it was, do I take it, be completely selfish and take care of myself or be responsible because I'm a mother. So I have to sacrifice myself and look after my kids. And I think with that, there's a lot of things that get lost in the way because we emulate our parents and we do what our parents do. So if our parents work hard, we're going to work hard. And that's the only thing that we're going to know until we meet people along the way that hold mirrors up to us. And then we slowly realize that, oh, fuck, I got to ponerme en pausa and take care of me because somehow the different situations that we go through because we hold on to trauma because even migration growing up, there's still trauma that comes from it. So we have to, that can, that can make us toxic. And emulating how our parents deal with their trauma or their situation can make us toxic too. You know, we learn how to do things in a toxic way. And with that, I was just like, I don't want to be my parents. Yeah. Yeah. I had a similar experience, but I did not see my mom really take care of herself, right? Um, and I struggle I more before than now, like to even get like a nice thing for me, right? And I remember my mom would be like, oh, debes comprarte, debes comprarte, you know? Like she will encourage me to get it, but like I would always revert to like, no, this is, I shouldn't waste my money like this. And I realized that when I, encourage my mom to buy something she's the same way she's like oh no I can't buy this on myself like I can't get myself nice earrings I can't get myself this nice blouse I'm like so yeah we pick up all those things from our parents so yeah. what do you hope to leave for generations to come I think what I hope to leave is that I've been reflecting a lot on the fact that um, that I am the first, my, my parents and myself, like, we're that generation that came to this country, right? And, um, and when you talk to Americans who've been here for generations and generations, they tend to forget how their family got here. 
and they tend to be disconnected with that struggle. Mm -hmm. And they, and that, and that's, I think that's one of the reasons why they judge so harshly, you know, on the people that have just arrived and are struggling to kind of make it. And I also think that's why one of the Americans that have been here for a long time also in a way are lost in, in their sense of identity because there's nothing that's grounding them. They're not connected to their stories, their culture, you know. Um, one thing I do when, um, when I talk to white Americans, I ask them where they're from, just like we would get asked mm -hmm. where we're from. And a lot of them say, oh, I'm from here. And I'm like, no, where's your family from? And I kind of push them, you know, think. In, a very respectful way, in a very respectful way, just to think and ponder, like, where did your family come from? And some of them were, would say, oh, well, Irish, you know, potato famine, or, you know, like Jew left, uh, left Europe, or other stories. And, and I see them struggling to, to connect to that story again. But it's also beautiful because I think they realize like, wow, yeah, like I am connected to this story of struggle, this story of starting over. And I think that more Americans, especially white Americans, should connect to that story, should connect to their roots, their culture from their homelands as well, right? And I don't want us, us, or the the, you know, the recent generation of Latino immigrants here, Peruvians especially, to ever lose that because we come from, you know, royalty, like Inca royalties. And, and, and I don't want to, and, and that is so grounding. And we come from a civilization that understood the stars, understood mathematics, were engineers, architects, you know. And so um, I, I think that grants us it gives us some sort of like uh, fortaleza interna. So, so I think what I would like to leave behind is it's a collection of those stories and the interviews I do to people, like for you know what that I do with with folks. Like one of my friends, I interview him. He has a four year old son, and in the interview that I did with him, he shares his story of how he came. Now he can share this recording with his son when he's old enough to understand. Mm -hmm. And I think, and I think that's what I want to leave behind. Like I want to help people record those stories so they can share with future generations. Um, yeah. yeah, definitely. I feel, you know, the only way that we get to keep on living is through our stories. All right, y'all, it's time for the One Piece. Not to be confused with the widely popular anime we all know and love. This is that one piece of advice you would give to a younger you. So, Natalie, after everything, the trials and tribulations, what advice would you give to a younger you? I would say that... that I don't have to make people happy. Mm. I, I think I have the personality um, where I felt responsible to bring joy to my family, whether it was through jokes, laughter, I saw some sort of tension at home and I was the, you know, the humor, like the com comic relief of that situation. And there were moments when I would say, well, who's, doing that for me, mm. like who's bringing that laughter uh, into my own life. And, and I realized that that is a gift, but it's also a gift that I have the right to choose when to give it. Um, and I think that's something that I didn't realize when I was young and that I gave it freely at the uh, expense of my own mm. joy. Girl. And now I protected it. <laughs> And I protected a bit more than I used to when I was younger. Yeah, I feel you on that. I feel that a lot of us immigrant kids have this or develop this people pleaser trait. Because, I mean, all the responsibilities that we had to take on. But I definitely love that answer you gave okay guys we've reached the end of this episode but before i bid you all adieu 
I want to pose a question to you all, mi gente. This week, I want to continue our thoughts on self-reflection and introspection. Last week, I spoke about what success is and what it looks like. We each have our own versions of success and what it means and what it looks like. And all of our experiences are 100% valid. So this week, let's touch base on fear. Fear is very real and it can hold us back and stop our blessings. But it can also protect. For me, as someone who lives with a mental disorder that can be debilitating, fear plays a huge part in my life. It stops me from reaching my purpose, from seizing moments, from becoming the successful person I want to be. Basically, fear keeps me from trying because I truly fear failing and falling flat on my face. So, mi gente, dime, which is worse, failing or never trying? Piénsenlo. Feel free to leave your insight and answers in the comment and review sections. Bueno, guys, this is it for this week's episode. Thank you, Natalie, so much for coming on letting me interview it's been an honor i look forward to all the stories you have lined up for peruvians of usa you know the one advice that i want to give you is keep going thank you babe it's been such a thrill speaking with you today and thank you for all you're doing and thank you for sharing all your stories and being vulnerable with your audience thank you thank you remember to follow us at oye mi gente podcast on instagram we are available on all your favorite streaming platforms be sure to subscribe and leave us a comment in the review section also follow at deacon media on instagram and if you want to know more about the deacon media network and what we do you can check out the entire Deacon Media family on deaconmedia.com. Ciao!